started hearing words of knowledge about people. Never experienced that in my life. It freaked me out uh, as much as it's freaking the person out that's getting healed, trying to figure out how I know about their life or the specific pain in their body. I'd never experienced the Lord like that. And it was in that moment that I felt the anointing. I went from being shy and not wanting to speak about Jesus. Now I can't shut up about Jesus. Acts 1 8, Jesus promises, but ye shall receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You shall be my witnesses. It's the purpose of power, it's proclamation. The power comes on him in Acts 2. And suddenly this guy who had beforehand denied Jesus is standing and boldly declaring unapologetically the yeah. gospel message. So how you like in Texas? I love it. I was just talking to my um my Lyft driver. He is Turkish and Italian, and he came here in the beginning of the year um, from Europe. And uh, he said he actually looked he looked uh, different places. I think it was here, Chicago, and I think it was Houston, and uh, and he chose here. Hmm. And I shared the gospel with him. He said nobody has ever asked him if he would be willing to give his life to Jesus. <laughs> And the whole car ride, I'm breaking down the gospel. And, and uh, I prayed for him at the end. He was so excited. I got his number. And um, he's just, he was feeling the love of God and the Holy Spirit. It was incredible. Yeah. And he was such a kind man. I think, yeah, that's one of the things I've always appreciated. How do you do it? Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I just got, we got a 30 minute drive. He was driving like a turtle, missing his exits. And the whole time, he's just, he's wait. captivated by the gospel. Wait, wait, message. wait. I didn't know turtles can drive. <laughs> <laughs> Tur Turtles cannot drive, <laughs> but apparently not. He was driving super slow, but he was so kind and sweet, but he was so captivated by the message of the gospel. Mm. It was incredible. He, yeah. he, Matt, yeah. that's one of the things I always appreciate about Matt is very evangelistic, as Christians should be. Yeah. And you've got stories for days Man. when it comes to evangelism and, and we sharing all be the better, gospel. You know? Yeah. Lately, I've been feeling the stirring again, like when I was younger. When we first oh, met, wow. what was that, in 2019? We were in Cerritos. We were just talking about it. Oh, yeah. So 2019, you know, we actually just got rid of that studio. Did you? Yeah, we transitioned mm -hmm. out of there. We had kept it for a while because we were still doing some productions there. Yeah. We had some people still working in that office. Oh. But we switched a lot of the people in California to remote. Okay. And then some of them moved out here. And so we basically said, okay, wow. it's time to close that chapter. I mean, we right. kept all the equipment, so it wow. wasn't like it was a yeah. It wasn't yeah. it wasn't a bad move. It yeah. was good. And That's and now awesome. we're just uh, in the next chapter here in Austin and enjoying that. Come on. Mm -hmm. And you're saying it's like what a year? It's been a year and a half. Yeah. So, but you were saying in 2019, what do you mean the passion like you used to? What do you mean? Well, when I was first stepping into full time ministry, like it was all all the time everywhere. Do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? And then, you, yeah. you know, life happens. Not that you stop witnessing, but you become, you know, the busyness of life and ministry. You know, and I'm, I'm taking naps on planes. And, you know, I, a lot of the time I was talking with people I was sitting next to, but things like that happened. So it, it just, it decreased with the amount mm -hmm. of people that I was speaking to on a daily basis. But I was feeling the past couple of days, actually, this stirring in my heart don't leave a place until, you know, you plant a seed wow. or water a seed mm -hmm. or watch God bring the increase on that. I appreciate you being open about that because I think that's something that's very rarely talked about yeah. in terms of the fatigue, the physical drain. Mm -hmm. And it's not that you lose your passion for the Lord or your love for the lost. It's yeah. not that you suddenly come to believe that the gospel isn't important. Yeah, There's just this very... I would almost say it's it just kind of creeps up on you. Mm -hmm. This I don't want to say low energy, but you get what I'm yeah, saying. Yeah, exactly. This what you're place saying. that you get to, and you know, Christians often say, "Well, I imagine that many Christians who watch your content would never believe that you come to a place like that." But I think it's encouraging mm -hmm. for people yeah. to hear that because they take note. Well, even ministers, even mm -hmm. pastors, even evangelists sometimes yeah. find themselves in situations like that. One hundred percent. We find ourselves going through the motions at times. You just got to bring yeah. yourself back, you know? How do you do that? I think it's being captivated by his presence, you know, remaining connected to the vine. And uh, so you can bear fruit so his life can flow through you. Um, and it all goes back to that, staying connected to the vine. What does that look like for you practically? Yeah, practically, I would say acknowledging him every day, being intentional and spending time with him not just obviously in secret, but 
throughout the day, just worshiping, um, searching my heart, asking the Lord, reveal anything in me. That's why I love messages that cut is because it, mm -hmm. it just, it sheds light on the areas that are, are not of him. And it reveals our selfishness, our pride, our arrogance, sin and corruption. And, uh, and every time I'm in the light of his presence, you know, I get reminded of that. And my heart becomes stirred toward, uh, toward holiness. You know, I start to, to hate what is harmful. I start to seek what is holy. Mm -hmm. So I think practically, yeah, it's, it's just acknowledging God, staying in the place of worship, staying in the place of fellowship, reading the scriptures. I mean, I've just been, oh my gosh, I've been preaching on the, how the word of God is a sword and it's meant to cut, it's meant mm -hmm. to reveal and, and divide the soul from the spirit. So it's, it's honestly more simple than people think. It's not rocket science, you know, mm -hmm. call out to him, talk to him, commune with him and, um, and watch the things that we hear, the things that we see, the things that we listen to. It all goes back to that. Things yeah. that are good for our spirit. Yeah. And feeding your spirit. Wait, when Matt showed up, I know one of the biggest things, like you mentioned earlier, is him tell him telling stories for days about him being in Uber cars. But I wanted to know what's your favorite one, because I want to touch on something. But I want to know your favorite story that you had about when you were ministering to somebody in a Zoom car or in an yeah. Uber car, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm saying, and then or in an airport or whatever. Yeah, I would say... I was in, it's kind of like a two-part story. I have two favorite stories. I'll say two of them quickly. Um, one time I was fasting. I was ending this fast, and I was supposed to preach in Yakima, Washington. And mm. uh, my flight got delayed. I had to stay overnight in Seattle. Um, and so I got a hotel. And I'm like, I haven't eaten anything. You know, I'm ready to kind of <laughs> just end this fast. Yeah. And uh, I'm chugging essential water, getting that pH, you know. Glory <laughs> to God. Is it Peach in here? <laughs> sure. Yeah. We hope Jesus' so. name is Peach. Um, so I'm, I needed to get an Uber from the airport to the hotel. And and I'm frustrated that my flight got delayed. I'm like, yeah. what are the odds of this happening? And I'm in the Uber. I'm you know it's a two-hour drive? Where? To Yakima from Seattle? I should have just drove. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> I should have got the Uber to take me to Yakima. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't even think of that. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Yeah, not that far. Um, so I was in this Uber and it was a, I think it was a Hindu man. Uh, and I just started preaching to him. And the whole time, I mean, he, he pulled over on the side of the road and he looked back. He said, the encounter podcast is brought to you in part by Numa streaming. It's about time. The kingdom of God had its own streaming platform. Numa features preachers and teachers of the word. And best of all, Numa does not censor them for sharing biblical truth. Numa is growing fast and currently features creators like David Diga Hernandez, Vlad Savchuk, Spencer Nakamura, and many more creators. You can watch Numa streaming for free using their website or one of their apps. Additionally, a portion of all Numa profits goes to supporting Christian ministries. The future of Christian media is here. Start watching for free now by visiting StreamNuma.com. Dot com. That's S T R E A M N U M A dot com. Streamnuma.com. So I was in this Uber and it was a, I think it was a Hindu man. Uh, and I just started preaching to him. And the whole time, I mean, he, he pulled over on the side of the road and he looked back. He said, How can I receive this Jesus that you're telling me about? Mm. And I was like, Oh my gosh. So we got outside the car. And I just took his hand and he surrendered his whole life to Christ. Sometimes that's all it takes is for a moment. Like this man in the car on the way here, he was saying how he wants truth. He's seeking mm. for truth. People are killing others. The world we're living in, it's just dirty. It's corrupt. It's sinful. We live in a sinful world. And he just keeps reiterating how he's seeking truth. And I'm like, there's no coincidence God put me in your vehicle yeah. to give you truth. Mm. His name is Jesus. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And he was just, his eyes were just, you could see it in his mm. eyes, man. But yeah, that story, man, the guy pulled over side of the road, gave his life to Christ. He asked me how, how can I receive this man you're talking about? And then this other lady was a Muslim woman. I landed um, back home in Chicago, got an Uber home, and I'm telling her about Jesus. I get a word, a word of knowledge about some pain she had in her back. She pulls over, she, her eyes get real big, and she says, um, what did she say? She was, oh, she said, Jesus is big. Jesus is big. 
And I, I remember that day because she was getting healed in her back as I was talking to her. Mm. She, the pain left and she's experiencing this power and she looks at, at the, uh, the back seat and she says, Jesus is big. And then I come to find out that her friends are Christian. They had been inviting her to church. Wow. I was just watering the, a seed that was already Now the planted. reason I personally ask is because you went viral on Facebook. I like, remember like that crazy. Video, yeah. yeah. And I heard about you from David. He goes, well, we're having Matt Cruz on. Uh, this was years ago. And I'm like, who's Matt Cruz? He goes, you don't know Matt Cruz? He goes viral on Facebook. I'm like, <laughs> okay. And then uh, I rewatched your videos like two days ago. And I've been listening to them. And I already know, like, you're just a great storyteller. You're like, oh, man, uh, this is how it happened. Like, one of your videos is called, uh, you say this, but God says that. Wow. Um, I remember that. And then there's another one where you're sharing a testimony of how uh, you prayed for someone's, like, grandmother over FaceTime. Yeah. Is that the one where he starts with, don't tell me God's yeah, not yeah. real? You're like, <laughs> don't tell me. And he's walking yeah. around holding his phone yeah. out like this. Just like this. Yeah. yeah. And I'm wondering... <laughs> I know you're sharing all these stories. They're coming from a great place. Like yeah. you're just sharing what God has done and you're encouraging people. But I was watching these and just from like a, I guess like a regular perspective of somebody that's not saved yeah. or somebody that is saved. Why do you think these went viral? Cause I'm listening to these and I'm like, how do I know this guy isn't lying? Yeah. And also if I, if that, if that was me that posted that, uh -huh. I don't think they would have gone viral. What make, what makes you think, or why do you think those went viral? And, and that's yeah. a good point about people's cynicism when they see stuff like this. They're like, you know, because some people's first inclination is, well, this is, how can that be real? Or how do you verify this story? Yeah. To, so to his point, do you think that was just the hand of God on this content? I think it was the hand of God and the sincerity and the passion. A lot of people, if you look at the comments, there's oh, hundreds of thousands of comments. And I was going through a couple hundred of them and I was reading... Um, the words that people were saying about the passion I had in my heart and it was very authentic. It was very genuine. And I think people appreciate that. Um, and they see, they see the God in us. And so I, I really think aside from that, it was, it was the hand of the Lord just breathing on the video and he knew that that's what would catapult me into where I am today. Um, but I think people are looking for authenticity. They're looking for, um, somebody with a fiery faith and passion, but with a mm. genuine heart, you know, I think oftentimes people receive from somebody who's very genuine and you could tell who's disingenuous and those who are obviously it takes discernment because some people will lie and, and you won't know right. about it until yeah. it comes out later. But, uh, yeah, I think it's the, the genuineness of the heart. So I'm curious. Yeah. I, I have a question. So like, Obviously, when you go evangelize, do you look at like certain people and you just get that inclination of like, okay, I got to talk to them? Or is it just literally, you know what, like you were saying earlier, I got to, I have this in my heart to share something with someone. I'm going to do it with whoever. Yeah. Or is it kind of like pre planned? You see someone, you're like, okay, I need to speak to them. So how's Great that question? I, I say both. Yeah. Both. A lot of times God highlights people. And then most of the time it's, and preach, preach to every living yeah. creature. What does yeah. a highlight look like for you? So like for me, it's a little bit different, but if you've seen those clips where I'm praying for people and bringing, up, yeah. bringing them up onto the platform, laying hands on them, for me, in that moment when I look at them, their surroundings literally go blurry and they come into just a wow. sharper focus, just a tad sharper, and I know I need to pray for that one. Yeah. Is that what you mean when you say highlight? Is it physical like that where you see something? Is it just something you know in your spirit? How does God speak to you in terms of pointing to people Yeah, it's like a out? magnetic pull. I'm mm -hmm. drawn to them. Mm -hmm. um, I, there's a knowing in my spirit. Yeah. They need breakthrough. They need Jesus. He has a word for them. Yeah. Uh, a lot of times I just I go out on a limb and just say, hey, <laughs> yeah. Has anybody ever told you about Jesus in Walmart <laughs> or in an Uber? Like, no. Or some would say, yeah, last week. And then that's actually my confirmation that I'm yeah. planting a seed that's, uh, or watering a seed that has already been planted. Wow. Um, so for me, it's like a light bulb goes on mm -hmm. uh, and it's a knowing. It's yeah. a knowing like, I'm supposed to tell you this. Mm. I'm supposed to pray with you. You're going through this. And this is what the Lord is saying to you yeah. in this season of your life. And they just... But I can't help but think of that listener right now who hears you saying that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But they're wondering, what do you mean it's a knowing? They want those specific details. Yeah. Well, the Holy Spirit, he brings all things back to your remembrance, mm -hmm. our remembrance. And, and he just, he stirs your heart. I mean, it's this unction. It's this prompting. And we have to obey the promptings of the Holy Spirit. 
And I tell people it doesn't matter if they receive it or not. It's the fact that you are willing to plant the seed, water the seed, um, and just be obedient because it's not our call for people to to accept the truth, but it is our call to ensure they have a chance. So they get yeah. that chance by you responding to the promptings, responding to the, mm. the unction and the knowing. And you just, when you're close with the Holy Spirit, you just know that you know that you know. And uh, a lot of times it's honestly, like, like I was saying a, a few moments ago, going out on a limb and yeah. just going for it because the worst thing that could happen is nothing. So I may never see this person again. <laughs> right. just... If you're going to err, err on the side of evangelism. Come on. Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, a couple of verses that come to my mind when you're talking. He gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. Now, this is what's often referenced to as the fivefold ministry. Mm. Some would argue that that phrase, pastors and teachers, is actually one position. Okay, um, we could consider that as a possibility, but the main point I want to glean from this is the fact that there are these different assignments to the body of Christ in terms mm. of the members of the body of Christ. Now, Ephesians 4 is referencing specifically those leadership positions, people in church authority. You have pastors and teachers, evangelists, apostles, prophets. When I think of your ministry, when I think of you, mm. I think of a true and genuine evangelist. Now, we understand that all believers ought to participate in the expansion of the kingdom through the sharing of the gospel. It yeah. should be a lifestyle, as Paul instructs, do the work of an evangelist. Yeah. But I also want to acknowledge that there are some who are especially gifted in certain areas of grace, and they've been given an assignment with a certain focal point of ministry. Mm -hmm. And as you're talking, I can't help but think of that word, evangelist, evangelist, evangelist. It burns in you. There's this passion for souls, and it's not something you do. It's who you are. Mm -hmm. When did that begin? When did you know you're an evangelist? I was just telling somebody this yesterday. Uh, We were in the sauna last night, and I was... I was sharing about when I was in high school, I always found myself, even though, even though I wasn't living for Jesus wholeheartedly, I found myself debating people. At that hmm. time, I didn't fully know. So I'm debating with my friends on the school bus and in the classrooms how Jesus is the only way. Yeah. And they're sharing about the teachings of Islam. And of course, hmm. we love and respect everybody. But I just, I, w- I grew up in a Christian home and I didn't understand what an evangelist was at that time. I didn't understand what the evangelistic call was or this evangelistic anointing that was on the inside of me, but I realized, even looking back, that it was it was in me and I was flowing in that. Wow. So even since I was a little boy quoting scriptures, memorizing scriptures, I always felt there's a call over my life, but I couldn't put my finger on it. And I think the moment I knew is when I had that encounter in the basement in 2016, mm-hmm. um, cold winter night with a buddy of mine, and and he's just praying in the spirit on the corner of the basement. I never experienced that before, and the Lord just filled me. And it was after that moment that I was empowered, and this pastor who was uh, over the evangelism ministry at a church, he took me under his wing, yeah. and the Lord highlighted me to him, and mm-hmm. he saw that evangelistic anointing over my life. And so he put language to what I was experiencing to what I was feeling and going out with him on the streets and in the grocery stores is when I realized I'm an evangelist. (laughs) Were you always drawn to it or were you somewhat resistant to it at the beginning or even before that encounter? I think it, I think it was even looking back to high school, me always like I'm in a parking lot with a friend and, and I'm talking about religion for an hour. I'm not even living for Jesus. I'm 16 years old. And I'm talking about religion in Christianity, and I'm I'm not even fully educated in the word. And so I think it was it was flowing out of me, but I also was was hesitant um, because I'll tell my parents you'll never see me preach. You told them that? I did tell them wow. that. Wow. How did that come up? What was the conversation that led you to say that? Because they would ask me to preach for the youth. All my siblings would preach. Yeah. And they would call on me and I would run to the bathroom full of anxiety. Do you know mm-hmm. I would because growing up, they would bring me, four years old, I would, they would stand me up on a chair. I would quote scriptures mm. to close out the service. Four years old. I did it for years. <laughs> Please tell me there's footage of this oh somewhere. I there's a photo. See this. I have a photo. <laughs> okay, we'll get the photo. We'll put it up on the screen uh, right yeah, here. There's there a photo. Is. I'm standing on a chair, and I'm quoting 
a scripture out of Jude and in different scriptures that I memorized. My parents had a, a detail shop and in my mom's office on the cabinet, it was full of post-it notes, different color post-it notes. And it's all scriptures and I would memorize all of them. Wow. So that was when I was a little boy. When I got to my teenage years, I was just living for myself. Was never a bad kid, but I often tell people I felt like I had enough of God in my life to not enjoy the world, but then I also felt like I had enough of the world in my life not to enjoy God. Mm -hmm. I was just going through the motions, attending church. I loved God. I told my parents, nobody can convince me God's not real. But when they would start calling on me, I don't know, it was like this... I don't know if it was rebellion or what, but I just did not want to speak in front of people. I found it terrifying and I was frustrated that they'll keep asking me. <laughs> so when they would, they no longer would bring me up how, when I was a little boy, cause it just kind of faded, mm -hmm. but I would still have this like, um, anxious feeling that they would call me up. Nobody really knows this for years, even to this day, actually, even to this day, every time they close out the service, it's like this feeling of they're going to call me up and my heart starts racing to this day. Huh. So when I was in my teenage years, <laughs> would you believe this? You know, when they say stand to your feet and they're going to bless the congregation, the pastors dismissing everybody, stretch your hands to me as I stretch my hands to you. Mm -hmm. I bless you with peace. I bless you with joy. <laughs> and then he's quoting a scripture. I would duck and act like I'm tying my shoe the <laughs> no entire way. time he's dismissing the service. Yeah. So nobody would find me. And they weren't thinking about bringing me up. I just was... I was full of anxiety in my mind. And, wow. and then they would ask me to uh, sing in the choir with my brothers. Hey, and let's go. Yeah, come on now. <laughs> and they would just ask me to preach for youth services. And I would be in the bathroom. I'm, I would hide in there. I'm not going out. And then I will tell my parents when I go home, don't, don't do this. I'm, I'm never going to preach. Like you all are preachers. You'll never see me do it. And wow. then God got a hold of me. So then you heart. have that encounter with the Lord in the basement. Yeah. After that, what was the progression of the Lord's ministry in your life? Being on the streets and in the grocery stores with that mm -hmm. pastor who mentored me, took me under his wing. I started hearing words of knowledge about people. Never experienced that in my life. It freaked me out. Yeah. Uh, as much as it's freaking the person out that's getting healed and trying to figure out how I know about their life or the pain and specific pain in their body. Uh, and I would see them get healed. And the pastor would come up to me as Pastor Jermaine kind-hearted man and uh, so appreciate his life and his voice, he would come up and I would just cry. And I'm like, you have to deal with this, finish this, talk yeah. to the lady. And I remember going on the bench and just sitting there and just bawling my eyes out because I'd never experienced the Lord like that. Yeah. And it was in that moment that uh, I just f I felt the anointing. And I said, man, I went from being shy and not wanting to speak about Jesus. Now I can't shut up about Jesus. And that's what the anointing does. It enables you to minister for the Lord beyond your natural capabilities. Mm. People may feel like they're not good enough, but when the anointing comes on you and you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're empowered to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. Uh, and I think that's what we need today. People who are empowered, clothed with power from on high, and they receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Like with Peter. Exactly. He denies the Lord Jesus in one instance. And then Acts 1.8, Jesus promises, but ye shall receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You yeah. shall be my witnesses. Come That's on. the purpose of power. It's proclamation. So the power comes on him in Acts 2. And suddenly this guy who had beforehand denied Jesus is standing and boldly declaring unapologetically the yeah. gospel message. And check this out. For every time he denied him, Come one, on. two, three, mm -hmm. there were a thousand that came to the cross. On. One, two, three thousand. Talk about redemption. Redemption. As beautiful. As beautiful. And that that is an encouragement to people listening today that this man was denying the Lord. And then you just fast forward like less than what, two months later, and he is preaching about Jesus in that way. Bull and mm -hmm. 3,000 people get saved. And what, what made the difference is because he was among the 120 in the upper room and he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire. So this mentor of yours who begins to pour into your life and he begins to guide you in the ways of evangelistic ministry, what would you say is the most important lesson that he taught you as a spiritual mentor? How to fast, how mm -hmm. to pray. Let me tell you, I was a wimp. <laughs> I would complain. I did more complaining than fasting. I would... I would be wanting to take naps 
during the entire duration of the fast. <laughs> yeah. I would I would borderline lived at his house. I was there all the time. So they would give me a blanket and I'm just like shivering. I'm like, I need food, you know. I'm hungry. <laughs> I, I was super four, four immature. Years old? <laughs> <laughs> a little baby. Give me a little bottle of milk. <laughs> so I would find myself just complaining, but he taught me how to fast, the power of fasting, the power of prayer. This man is a praying man. Mm. He's a praying he is one who prays without ceasing. And so watching his life taught me how to live a life of fasting, how to live a life of prayer, and how important it is, how vital it is to live in the place of prayer. Yeah. And I'm grateful for that because um, as we know, a prayerless Christian is a powerless Christian. And if you want to walk in power, you know what they say, and the uh, uh, old saints, a lot of prayer, a lot of power, a little prayer, a little power, mm -hmm. you know? And so I, I learned that, and, and I think it's, uh, it's the main thing. It's a life of every believer. We should be living in that and praying without ceasing because the devil's praying without ceasing. Yeah. I, I, I think about, like, Generation Z, right, and how, you know, they can just hop on to any device and just start preaching. And you yeah. talk about mentorship, and I always, I'm always wondering, like, I wonder if they have some type of covering because sometimes I listen to these guys and it's their flow, right? It's Gen Z, it's a different generation, but I'm just listening, I'm like, what are they talking about sometimes? And I just yeah. think how important like mentorship and that kind of lifestyle is, and especially because we have so, anyone can be uh, on TikTok, anyone can be on Facebook, right? But like, what would you say to like those young guys? Because sometimes I want to say something, I just don't know what. Like, hey, get plugged into a church or get a mentor with you because yeah. we got to make sure you're, you're, you're the one that's going to talk to my children, Yeah. right? And their children's children, like it just goes on and on. So what would you say? I'm glad I'm not the only one thinking that. <laughs> I see that a lot. And I think, you know, everybody has a platform, but not everybody has a voice. Right. And I think you get that voice by being developed because we have so many people, you know, they're chasing the platforms and they're mm -hmm. chasing the microphones and they desire to be seen and they want to be used by God. And, and I understand. And, and the Lord desires to use us but they're trying to speed to the highest seat in the mm. shortest amount of time. And then their life with their life being severely underdeveloped. And so I look back and, you know, people wonder like, how did you go viral on this? I don't know. God did it. But I, all I know is that the seed was in me since I was a little wow. boy. Yeah. And my parents did a phenomenal job of raising their kids in the ways mm. of the Lord. And now I'm 28 years old. I'm, I'm looking back. I'm not going to depart from the truth. Like I know Jesus, I've come to the knowledge of the truth but it was in me and I didn't know God was developing me all of my life and even still up to this, mm. this day and this hour. Uh, but I see people like that, especially young ones. And I think it's well, important. For the record, guys, I, I think we should count ourselves as young. <laughs> yes. Those we're not, we're not old. <laughs> we, we sound like curmudgeons. <laughs> Those Gen Z kids. Where am I looking here? I want you to know that they are not old. Uh, they are young. <laughs> yes. I like to say that the warranties seem to expire at 30. <laughs> That's hilarious. That is hilarious. Diga just turned 43, but he's still young. <laughs> they say a preacher is not in his prime until the, he's the 45. So you got preserves. a few more years. The anointing preserves. Yes. Uh, to that point, I think what you're saying is 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 key. And we don't want to sound judgmental or yeah. like we're not for a generation of preachers rising. That's yeah. not at all what we're saying. Mm -hmm. But I think there is some concern, especially because many people are going right for the platform while skipping the process. And because anyone can have access to a public expression via social media, it seems that anyone can bypass the process that would develop the character mm -hmm. necessary for God to wow. choose to promote you. You look at the book of Acts and you see the model of the church. There's a very structured, organized, reverent way that God appoints people into ministry. Yeah. This is why Paul wrote, don't lay hands on any man suddenly. He didn't write that because he wanted to scare the church into believing that demons are like pathogens and that if you touch somebody with a demon that you're going to catch that demon. He says, don't lay hands suddenly in that by laying hands, you were ceremoniously and spiritually appointing someone to a position of leadership mm -hmm. and acknowledging as church leadership that this individual was in fact vetted, processed, and now being appointed right. to that position. Yeah. And so I think that we forget that God does use spiritual leaders, and there mm. seems to be this general disdain for leadership in the church world today. I understand we have fallen leaders. I understand that some get off into heresy, 
But generally speaking, spiritual headship is a good thing to have. Mm -hmm. And we see that in the lives of those who are appointed in the early church. And then I also see that in your testimony, mm -hmm. where you were raised in church, people poured into your life. And I'm not saying that you have to be raised in church in order to be a leader. I'm saying that there has to be this acknowledgement from at least someone who is grounded and rooted and themselves having been appointed as a leader in the church. Yeah. There has to be this community involvement where the local body of believers acknowledge what God is doing in your life. And right. that's what we see in scripture. I know people don't, may not like that, but too bad. That's what the scripture teaches. Yeah. And, and that's a safety net because even the, I mean, it's very clear in the epistles that if you appoint someone into leadership too soon, they may be filled with pride and that will destroy them. Mm -hmm. The problem is that many people are entering positions without the character within them being strong enough to handle the pressures that come against them. Wow. And yeah. if the pressures that come against you are heavier than is proportionate the strength within you, that is of your character, wow. then you'll be crushed. Wow. And mm -hmm. so that's what we're seeing. And I think that's what we're expressing yeah. here is not this... Again, I know we joked about it, but in all seriousness, we're not these curmudgeons, you know, shaking our fist at those uh -huh. young people. Um, we're not old, first of all, but 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 second of all, that's not. Right. We're not saying that we don't want to see anybody rise. We're saying yeah. that that there seems to be this skipping of a biblical process yeah. that is very common these days, yeah. and that is dangerous. Bringing that back to your testimony, you were raised in church. Not that that's the prerequisite, but it helps. And your parents imparted the word. You came under this mentorship. You responded to the call. And I'm sure you weren't knocking on doors and passing out business cards mm -hmm. saying, hey, I'm Matt. I'm an evangelist. Have me speak at your church. Yeah. I'm sure the Lord began to raise you. How did that look? Yeah. I mean, people were commenting on the videos and saying, mm -hmm. um, how can we get you to come out and speak at our youth conference or at our Sunday church service? And I was like, oh, I never experienced this before. I never got asked that before. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's when the process came where people started helping me. I got like a website. I'm like, well, we have to find a way where people can reach out and um, invite me to, to, to be with them. And I, I never experienced that before. So my first place, I was in Denver, Colorado, and, and it just became a thing. The Lord started opening doors. And I think it, wow. it's his favor. People ask me, what is the key? How do you get invited places? How are you with these great men of God? And I tell them, it's the favor of God. I have nothing. My secret sauce is that my heart is pure <laughs> and Jesus is my everything. Yeah. And he is the one who opens doors. No man can shut. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. But because I'm on assignment and I've said yes to the call and the timing of God, he, he's the one that is orchestrating every small detail wow. of my life. I mean, my schedule, I'm booked throughout the, and not to say it's to boast, but I'm busy from, from January to December. Mm. And it just so happens that throughout the year, whenever my family has our family vacation annually, I just so happen not to have any dates that I'm preaching. It just <laughs> open those dates. And I'm like, the Lord orchestrates my schedule, my life. If I'm not preaching for weeks or for a month, it's because he doesn't want me to. I'm, I'm doing something, you know, at home I'm on assignment. He's working in my heart. He's teaching me something, you know, he's trying to get me to see something. So I started to see uh, that it was the Lord, and um, I was just talking about this on a live stream the other day um, about how when we grow in Christ or when we mature in Christ, uh, we have a change in our appetite and our desires change. So I think some some young ones, um, and again, God desires to use them, and God's raising yeah. up this young generation right now, um, but we have to know why we're saved, why we believe what we believe. Yeah. We can preach, but do we live holy? We could mm -hmm. prophesy, but do we honor our parents? Mm -hmm. We are we are doing these things, but are we are we living our life according to the written word of God? Are we yielded vessels to the Holy Spirit? Are we uh, fit vessels for His use? Mm -hmm. And I think it comes with having that covering and having a pastor. Some people need, you know, a therapist. <laughs> <laughs> I believe, you know, and having a good circle and people that can cover you. This is a joke, but. Um, and God, God is doing it. But if we yield our life to him and he does what he needs to do in here and he refines us, people get upset or frustrated in the waiting seasons and in the crushing seasons, but it's not meant to consume us or overwhelm us. It's meant to refine us Wow! and, uh, to prepare us. You're, you're very young to be traveling and preaching. Cause I see at least a lot of people that I've seen are 
more mature, as we could say, uh, yeah. over 30 plus maybe, uh-huh. and doing what you're doing. I, in, in your church and when you're traveling, do you ever experience like a lot of jealousy from these people that are probably older than you? That's a great question. I think some, yeah. May I share a story? Sure. <laughs> this was years ago. I was at a conference um, in Corpus Christi, and this youth group came to this conference that I was speaking at. And, you know, it was like a Saturday night. You know, I had a hat on. Um, and this youth group was there, and their pastor came with them. And the youth leader came up to me after the service and said, hey, we would love to have you for our youth conference. We enjoyed your message. We enjoy your ministry. And I said, yes, absolutely. You know, if, you're, if your pastor approves, like we can, you know, we can talk and connect over the phone. I would love to hear about what God is doing in your region. So we, we get connected. Um, and I, I talked to the pastor over the phone and he's, he's telling me, I thought he was joking at first. And he was like, you know, I see you with your hat on and you're young and all these young people are inspired by you. And, and I just looked at you and the Lord told me, you see that guy, he is a, a Pharisee. Whoa. It's, Gee. I'm, I'm laughing because I'm thinking he's joking with me. Yeah. So this, <laughs> and this is when I was younger, way younger. And he's calling me a Pharisee, saying the Lord told him wow. I'm a Pharisee. How do you argue with that? <laughs> <laughs> right. So I'm on the phone and, and he's going on, uh, but he still wants me to come out. And I'm like, I, I never experienced something like that before. And so I was grieved in my heart for three days. I was grieved and I was mm. praying about it. I was praying for him, and I said, Lord, I've never experienced this before. And when those, I think it was like the fourth day, the man reached out to me. He actually sent me this long text, and he said the Holy Spirit dealt with him and convicted him, and he hasn't stopped crying, and his wife, like, he, of course, his wife yelled at him when she found out. Mm. And he said <laughs> the Lord really rebuked him, and wow. that he was out of order. And then he began to tell me that he was jealous because when he was my age, uh, he wanted to travel and be an evangelist, and that didn't work out for him. So when he's seen me, this young guy reminded him of when he was my age. And yeah, so. I think the Lord mm-hmm. brings us to those situations to test us. Mm-hmm. And I would say that one man's flaw is another man's test. I've been in many situations to where I can sense the jealousy, either through these subtle jabs. I'm sure you get that a lot, mm-hmm. these little backwards com- compliments, these these hidden messages behind what's being said, these little power maneuvers, and maybe not everyone will know what I'm talking about, but mm-hmm. you know exactly what I'm describing. And, yeah. and sadly, it's the way it is sometimes in, in certain spheres and certain rooms. But you know, I love that you've kept your heart pure. And I think it's important that we as ministers recognize The Encounter Podcast is sponsored in part by the partners and donors of David Hernandez Ministries. Your monthly gift or one-time donation enables us to reach the masses with the gospel of Jesus Christ through events and media. Join the movement and unite with thousands of believers around the world in supporting this growing, effective evangelistic ministry. You can begin your partnership today for as little as $15 a month. Visit davidhernandezministries.com slash partner to become a monthly supporter, or you can go to davidhernandezministries.com slash donate to give a one-time gift. It's the way it is sometimes in, in certain spheres and certain rooms, but you know, I love that you've kept your heart pure, and I think it's important that we as ministers recognize that there will always be that test mm-hmm. as the Lord begins to raise you. Yeah there will be attacks of jealousy. There'll be attacks of jealousy um, from people who think like you, but want what you have, but the Lord didn't give it to them for one reason or another. There's the heresy hunters who nitpick and critique every little thing you say. Uh, There's members of the body of Christ even that just in general have this overall sense of jealousy and they Mm. don't even know why that is. In terms of dealing with that jealousy coming against you, just in that, like I said, in a general sense, yeah. in terms of that jealousy coming against you, how does the Lord help you to deal with that in a way that is mature and is going to move you forward as opposed to holding you back? That's so powerful. I think it's viewing them how God views them, mm. seeing them through the lens of Christ. 
Uh, it definitely hurts. Yeah. Experiencing even in a few things right now and wondering to myself, why are they that way? Why am I being treated this way? And what did I do to them? Wow. And, and the Lord just brings it back uh, in my heart when I'm in prayer of blessing them, praying for them. For scripture tells us to, to bless those who curse you, mm -hmm. pray for those who mistreat you, who despitefully use you. And I just try my best to look at that person and also remind myself we don't battle against flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. And they can be going through something, and I don't know what it is. It could be going through a tough season or they're frustrated or something inwardly is going on. And so I try not to to judge and say, Lord, you are the one that deals with them. And I just ask the Holy Spirit that he would pierce their heart with compassion and and to allow them to see rightly and yeah. and to not, you know, to carry themselves in the right way, to embody the character and the nature of Christ. Um, but yeah, it, it sucks and it hurts, but I just try to look at them, um, how God views them. Yeah. And, uh, and love them, you know. What's the future hold for the ministry in terms of what God's revealed to you? Well, that's a big one. I'm going to move to Texas and become a part of this ministry now. You did? <laughs> you heard it here first. Media? Matt Cruz is coming to Austin. <laughs> you ready? Um, yeah, I, I, I have a heart for discipleship. So I want to... Right now, actually, I just launched a discipleship intensive that's starting next month. It's three months, and for the 12 weeks, um, it's taking the, the students on a journey of understanding the foundation of Christianity, uh, the call to follow Jesus, the cost of discipleship, and living as a disciple, understanding ministry ethics, how to main, build and maintain a devotion life, keep an oil in your lamp so it can burn brightly, all that stuff. But I, I have a heart for discipleship now more than ever, and... And what I see is uh, is like a discipleship school, people just being raised up and um, those who desire to learn and those who, who need a covering and those who want to be empowered and commissioned and equipped. Yeah, um, I want to make myself available and be part of that somehow. How would um, you define discipleship? Discipleship is helping people become disciplined, mature followers of Christ. It's walking with people into the kingdom. Billy Graham said, uh, salvation is free, but discipleship will cost you everything. And I've learned that salvation is Jesus laying down his life for us, but discipleship is us laying down our life for him. And it's, be, it's the process of becoming like him. It's the process of looking like him in every aspect of our lives, producing fruit and uh, staying connected to the vine. And that is how we can bear fruit. He says, apart from me, you could do nothing. So I think it's it's the process of becoming mature, devoted, and disciplined followers of Christ. What do you think the challenges are today in the modern church for people wanting to experience Christ in that way? What is the main inhibitor for this generation mm -hmm. becoming disciples? The gospel of convenience being preached in America, mm -hmm. cultural Christianity that's worn like a badge of honor, but there's no self-denial. It's this gospel that serves me, mm. uh, is tailored to meet my preferences and my desires rather than changes me and benefits me rather than transforms me. And I think that we have to confront this. It's a sovereign reality in America. There's a prevalent gospel being preached that promises blessings um, and, and joy without struggle you know, uh, blessings without surrender, uh, uh, comfort over conviction. And I think that we have to rise above that and say, I need to know the real gospel of Jesus Christ and that I, it, it, I need to leave, live a life of surrender. God is calling me to die to what I feel, to what I think, to what I want, and to surrender my agenda for his. Paul says, it's no longer I who lives, live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith and the Son of God who gave, who loved me and gave himself for me. So I think it's it's getting to the place where we completely die to ourselves. I really believe that the secret to living is dying. Mm. And when we just die to our what we preferences and what we we have planned and our our uh 
our desires, like scripture says that the many plans are in the, in the person's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that prevails. So I think is when the moment we die and we come alive in him and he comes in and becomes Lord, many people call him the savior, but they don't call him Lord. When he's Lord and you come under his Lordship, I think that's the, that's the key right there. Speaking of that death to self, what would you say was the biggest and most challenging sacrifice that the Lord has had you make? Wow. Put me on blast. <laughs> let's let's talk about it. Uh, I think for me, so when I was 19, God gripped my heart. I, I went into a ministry, and then about a year and a half later, February of 2018, I went into full-time ministry. I think for me, I struggled with rejection a lot, and mm-hmm. I cared about what people thought about me. So if like somebody wouldn't... Um, now it's totally different, but at the time I'm young, I'm 20 years old. Uh, it's say, for example, somebody would be talking to me. And if I, if I feel like they don't respond in a certain way, I'm like, what did I do to them? Mm. You know, did I do something wrong? Am I out of order? And so it was just, um, this toxic thing of rejection. And so I, I really believe that for me, um, my foundation was shaky and the Lord needed to deal with that. Um, so I think from, it wasn't necessarily like I need to lay this down or this down. I think it was everything. When I, when I encountered him in the basement, I just, I surrendered everything. And I think it's a daily, the daily struggles, you know, the daily attacks and daily temptations, of course. But for me, I, I think God had to deal with the foundation of who Matt is. And he did it through understanding sonship. You ministering and evangelizing at such a young age. Do you have any like stories where it's, Things just went south. They're very negative when you're evangelizing to somebody, like someone attacking you or like cussing you out. Oh yeah. What's I like the people. biggest one that pops up to your head? The biggest one that pops into my head. Um, I was on a street corner. This this person was just yelling at me. Just yelling. Like, <laughs> I don't need that. You. But it's so funny because they always break down, and they you, you can mm. see it in their eyes. Like they need. Jesus. I haven't been through anything crazy, uh, but it just people swearing and cussing and, and telling me to shut up. Jeez. Do you yeah, think free evangelism is still necessary? Oh, that's a, you're hitting it. Um, that's a hot topic right there. Mm-hmm. I think, I think it's, I think it's necessary, but for me, you know, when I see people holding up signs and, yeah, you know, yeah. Stop, drop, and roll doesn't work in hell, you know? <laughs> I, I, well, I see in the back of trucks and people holding up signs yeah, like repent yeah. or you're burning in hell. And Okay, we know the wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life. So I, I think it's 100% true. Stop, drop, and roll doesn't work in hell, but it's incomplete mm. because you want to meet people where they are. Right. And I think that I always go back to the gospel is an announcement, not an argument. And we're called mm. to share it, not shove it. That's so good. I remember I was somewhat, I, I spent some time with a street preacher by the name of Jed Smock. Now, he passed, was this a couple years ago? It that brother Jed passed away? Yeah. I don't know if you've ever heard of Jed Smock. They call him yeah. the father of campus ministry. Wow. And I believe in the late 70s, early 80s, his ministry really began to pick up momentum. Huh. And he would stand out in the university in campus courtyards and just declare the gospel and thousands of students would gather around to hear him preach. Wow. And so for a season, I went with him. I was probably about, I want to say 15, 16 years old. So you have to picture this. He would take me with him to these universities and college campuses. And at these universities on these college campuses, they have what are called free speech zones. Oh. Now, technically, you're supposed to have free speech everywhere if it's a publicly owned, right. but that's besides the point. So we would go into these free speech zones and he would just start to preach and he would begin with a hellfire and brimstone sermon. And this is what he said is how he drew the crowds in. And then once the crowd was gathered, he began to philosophize and he was very articulate, very intelligent. I think, and I'm not saying this just as a compliment, I mean it in the literal sense, I believe the man was a genius, as in like his IQ was probably off the charts. And people didn't quite get his methodologies, uh, but 
I remember he would put me up there and he would say, okay, now it's your turn. Uh-huh. And that's how he trained me to do wow. open air yeah. preaching was just <laughs> putting me out there. He said, how many scriptures do you have memorized? What Just preach the parts you know and, and go from there. Uh-huh. And when I say that it was like throwing me to the wolves, I would stand up there and these, some of them philosophy students, some of them professors would begin to argue with me. Uh-huh. And nine times out of 10, I did not have the answer. Nine times out of 10, I could not explain the scripture. Nine times out of 10, I could not refute the argument. And this began to sharpen me. And I remember beginning to do these types of evangelistic outreaches. It was very difficult. And after a while, it began to polish my knowledge of the word. It began to uh, assist me in being able to articulate rebuttals and explain the way of the gospel, you know, as Paul did, he reasoned. Uh-huh. And of course, there's the demonstration of miracles. I didn't come to you with persuasive words, but in the demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit, that's important. Yeah. But there also is an aspect of ministry that requires that you be able to explain the scriptures to give reason for the hope that is within you. Yeah. And so eventually I began to see that there was this development of this ability to do that kind of open air preaching. Now I'm of the belief and I, and I, and I, and I get that point and I'm, I'm on the same page as you in terms of some people are aggressive and offensive for the sake of being offensive. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's, it. that's yeah. where you and I are on the same page there where it's like, okay, you're just trying to make people angry. You're, yeah. you're being antagonistic because you enjoy seeing the reaction. Right. Um, you preach on hell all the time. I preach on hell all the time for the sake of sharing the gospel. This is Jesus saves from sin and hell. And we present that. Yeah. And so I think that when, 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 when the sinner stands before God, I'm not saying this is exactly how it will play out, but I think that when an unbeliever stands before the Lord, that they're going to be without excuse Mm -hmm. because the Lord's going to be able to say, I sent everyone from the people Mm -hmm. who are criticized for preaching with too much grace all the way down to the people who are said to be preaching too much about hell and everyone in between, and you responded to none of them. Wow. That's powerful. So, so that actually puts it into perspective why people do wild things or odd things, and some are doing it because they're, you know, attention seekers. Many times. Many times. But using that to gather people is incredible. And Paul says, therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Right. So we're called to have an urgency, but I love that. And in all honesty, I wouldn't use all of his methods. There were some right. things I saw and I was like, okay, that's, <laughs> you know, you, yeah. it, it, hey, I'm not going to judge God's servant. That's not mm-hmm. on me. But at the same time, I would like, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to word yeah. it that way. Uh, but but I, I so honor the way that you honor so many different expressions of ministry. Yeah. I love that about your ministry. Amen. Do you ever have businesses where you're evangelizing or like, for example, right now on your way here on an Uber where you're just like, I'm stumped. I don't know what to tell them because they're trying to rebuttal with you and like trying to argue with you. Yeah, I um, I just focus on planting the seed because some people are very hard headed, very hard hearted. And you just have to give them the love of Jesus. And if they don't want to accept it, then, hey, the seed speaks louder than what you what you think. Mm-hmm. And in your ideologies and what you're saying to me and your attitude toward me, you know, the seed speaks louder. So I, I focus on the power of, of planting the seed. And, uh, and then I remind myself that it's the Lord who does the saving and he's the one that can, you know, stir a, a very hardened heart. And he's the one that removes the stony hearts and gives us a heart of flesh. So I start reminding myself that, oh, he's the one that can do a better job than me. At, at saving. We don't do the yeah. saving. So what do you do when, let's say you're evangelizing a loved one, you're sharing the gospel with them, and just time after time, they're rejecting mm-hmm. the word that's being preached to them. How do you approach that? I try to, I believe, I tell people this, the best sermon that we could preach is not with our lips, it's with our life. So our yeah. family is watching how we live. Our coworkers are watching how we live. Our neighbors are watching how we live. So how am I representing Christ well? And so if they're constantly rejecting it, I try to let the fruit of my life bear witness of who I am. And for them to say, if this is how Christ loves, then I'm in. Hmm. If this is how Jesus loves on people, then I want that. So it's, it's, um, the way that I live 
And if they reject it, then I will pray that God sends the right people to minister to them in a way they'll listen and understand. And I'll, that, that would be my focus in prayer is for the Lord to send the right ones. Yeah, that's powerful. I love um, <clears throat> something funny I was thinking about. You're from Chicago. You've never been to Chicago. It's one of the windiest cities, right? Uh -huh. I didn't think it was that windy. I was literally walking and I felt like an American flag just flying in the wind, American trying to hold flag. on to the whole pole, you know? It was so windy. But I always think of like people are literally going from A to B just real quick. How do you like, like get their attention in that kind of big city, that big atmosphere? People want to go, they want to do their thing and you, you can harness that. Like how do you get them to just stop and listen to you? Yeah, I think a lot of people do like open air preaching and stuff like that. I personally feel like this is me personally. I feel like it's bothersome. Like I'm like bothering right, people, right. you know, I'm more of like a reach the one one-on-one -on -one type person. So if one person's standing by, I'll just go up to them and start, you know, chatting with them and, and breaking the ice and having a conversation. Uh, but I'll just walk with them, mm. walk with them, get their attention, say something to get their attention. And when they start, <laughs> yeah. you know, looking at me and I'll just make a conversation with them. But, but you have like such a good conversion rate. I hear nothing but good stories from you. They're like, oh, at the end they accepted Christ or at the end they got, got healed. healed. Yeah. Do you think that <laughs> happens because you have so many no's in your past from people just ignoring it all the time and saying, don't talk to me? Yeah, I believe that. And it is, it's both. I just don't share the ones where they <laughs> slap me and beat me up in the corner with a bat <laughs> and I have bruises I can show you. No, I'm just kidding. I'm messing. <laughs> Uh, no, I get yeah, rejected all the time. It happens, but, um, yeah. And I think the, Re the reason, I think the reason that Ruben's asking is because it really is encouraging for people to hear mm. all of the different aspects of how people respond, all of the different ways that people might react to what you're saying. But I want to ask you in terms of that boldness that you carry, there are some Christians who look at that and say, I wish I had that. Yeah. I wish that I had the boldness to, in an Uber, talk to somebody who's driving me or go up to that clerk at the gas station or whatever it may be. Yeah. Is that something that can be cultivated? If so, how do you cultivate that kind of boldness? I think it comes from the Holy Spirit. And being baptized in the Holy Spirit and fire, you get that holy boldness. I went from being shy. I was the last person to be bold far from being bold um, with witnessing. And when he came upon me, his power came upon me. I just, it was ignited into my heart and I had this holy boldness and courage that I didn't have before. And it's cultivated by asking the Lord to give you a love for the lost. Souls are the heartbeat of God, you know, and those who go out and win souls are wise. And I think it's just asking the Lord, number one, give me holy boldness because he will. You ask and, and you shall receive. You know, he desires to give his people boldness. And number two, I would I would pray um, that the Lord would give you a love for the lost, that you would start bleeding for the lost. And and when you catch that, it's just, it's very contagious. Even being around people, being around soul winners, we're all called to be soul winners. Uh, but the Holy Spirit is the one who gives you boldness. And as you yield to him, you can cultivate that. But for me, it came by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So somebody listening to that might misunderstand that as saying, if you're not bold, you don't have the Holy Spirit. That's not what you're saying. You and I both know that. I'm glad you covered that. I'm thinking in terms of, <laughs> well, because I'm only saying that because that's how I used to think. Yeah. I was always thinking worst case scenario, right? Many people know I struggled with anxiety for years. So hearing that, I would have freaked out and said, well, so I don't have the Holy Spirit. It was a great explanation. I hope it doesn't come across as uh -huh. me saying it wasn't a clear explanation. Yeah. You gave a great explanation but someone with the mind that's anxious might move to that conclusion immediately. Yeah. So help that person. Okay. I asked for the Holy Spirit. I'm a born again believer. I, I have had encounters with the Lord, but no matter what I do, I can't seem to step into that place of boldness. What should I do? Yeah. Get his book. <laughs> <laughs> he says it best. At, I took notes of you saying this at salvation, you receive him. At baptism, you release him. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Maybe you can expound on that, how <laughs> he, he wrote a whole book on it. Another question and, back at D. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You tell us. <laughs> no, I, th I think it, you are 100% saved because some people believe that. Some people preach that. You're not saved. This is a whole theological mm -hmm. thing. 
if you don't speak in tongues, you are not saved. You do not have the Holy what Spirit. What a wild conclusion. Huh? Yeah. Could you could you give context to that? <laughs> to what? What you just said? Yeah. I well, would love to hear your thoughts well, on that. Well, Ephesians chapter 1 makes it very clear that the very moment I have the Holy Spirit, I'm sealed by the Holy Spirit unto salvation. Romans chapter 8 makes it clear that I can't be a child of God mm. without the Holy Spirit and that if I don't have the Holy Spirit, I'm not a child of God. In John chapter 3, Jesus talks about being born again of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. So if it's of the Spirit, that means he's involved the very moment I'm born again. You receive the Holy Spirit the very moment you are born again. Anything that says otherwise is a total misunderstanding of mm -hmm. any scripture that might be quoted to support that unbiblical idea. So then the question is, why then do I have to experience all these other secondary experiences? For example, the disciples who followed Jesus, the 72, the 12, uh, various people around Jesus were given certain abilities by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And indeed, the Holy Spirit did empower them. In John chapter 20, verse 22, Jesus breathes on the disciples and says, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So they received some type of flow of power upon them in that moment. Wow. In Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes upon the church. And of course, we know that Peter and John are among them. Sure. And then in Acts chapter 4, we see that after enduring persecution in response to the religious leaders telling them to no longer preach the gospel, the church gathers for prayer. And then it says that they all were filled with the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 4, Peter and John were also among them. And then it says that they began to pray for more miracles and greater boldness. And I'm thinking, well, you were already filled with the Holy Spirit. So Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18 makes it clear. It says, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. That term, be filled, in the original language speaks of this ongoing experience. Mm. There's the infilling of the Holy Spirit, like water in a cup, yeah. where it's filled and then a static existence. And then there's the filling of the Holy Spirit like wind in a sail, which is a continual influence of the Holy Spirit that helps us to move through everyday life in the way that Christ would. And so we do, in fact, have the Holy Spirit. So the question is, does the Holy Spirit have you? So tongues would be an expression yeah. Yeah. that comes about as a result of surrender to the Holy Spirit, not in receiving him. Because in order to speak in tongues, I have to have him first. It's not necessarily always simultaneous. It's that the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in me. And from that place of indwelling, John chapter 7, 30, John chapter 7 verse 38, out of your innermost being yeah. shall flow rivers of living water. What does that mean, innermost being? 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, body, soul, spirit. My innermost being is my spirit. Hmm. And from my spirit flows that influence of the Holy Spirit touching the soul expressing itself in the body and the gift of tongues being expressed through the physical vocalization of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Mm. That means that that comes later. So it begins from within and then flows to without. So to say that you need to speak in tongues in order to be saved is to add to the gospel. Mm. It's to misunderstand the role of the Holy Spirit. It's to misunderstand the nature and the power of the Holy Spirit. It's to misunderstand the timing of the receiving of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 make it clear that there's no work that we do that contributes to our salvation or the keeping of our salvation. And that would be tongues included. Mm. Come on now. Mic drop. Well, <laughs> in a practical Mike sense, though, would you say it's easier to evangelize because you put in so many reps, I guess you could say? Oh, that's a good question. It's a really good question. I, I think I think it helps. If you when you look at doing reps with working out with weights, you know, you see the results after so many reps. You, you, you gain muscle after so many reps. So I think I think after witnessing to so many people, you start to carry more of the heart of God and, and you start to hear him more clearly. You start to become more in tune with his voice and, and his heart for lost people. Um, see, I think it does become um, more clear. Mm. You can see clearly. Yeah. Do you think, do you ever think about capturing these moments? Because you always share them, great stories, but do you ever mm. think about capturing these moments? Because I think that would make for great content. Yeah, I so many people tell me this, and this is why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> right here, no, right the, now. These are the people to talk to right here. <laughs> um, this is exactly why I'm here. Um, I've had people tell me, why don't you put them in a book, a bunch of testimonies and stuff. Uh, there, no, there not are a some, book. Video, video, yeah, dude. video. Thank you. It's easier. <laughs> well, um, where, would, where would you draw the line? Because there is some debate on that. Yeah. It's that culture that goes out into the world 
with cash in hand, shoving a cell phone camera in some homeless man's face and saying, hey, uh -huh. I got you this money. Yeah. And of course, that's virtue signaling. That's look at me culture. So how do you balance that? Because mm. to some degree, I mean, we do know that Jesus did say to let your works be done before man, yeah. that they might glorify the heavenly father. So let your light so shine in that way. But then we also know in, I believe it's Matthew 6, yeah. where Jesus is talking about doing things openly and publicly in order to be seen. So he's right. addressing motives. So Jesus didn't rule out entirely this idea of doing good works in front of people so long as your motives are in check. Uh -huh. But what do you think of that? What do you think of, I mean, I, and I suppose it would expand beyond even just evangelism. You know, there's the street deliverance, there's street healing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's different than people coming to a service where they know if, especially if they walk onto the platform. That's yeah. partly mm -hmm. why we do yeah. it the way we do it. Yeah. Where we have these healing testimonies come up and testify. Mm -hmm. They realize, I'm going to go up and testify, and I see the cameras. I understand that I'm going to go publicly share my testimony. Yeah. But I imagine that's a bit challenging, mm -hmm. going to the streets, taking a camera. Yeah. How do you balance that in terms of, obviously we know your motives are in the right place, but in terms of being respectful of people's privacy, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I was going to say it all goes back to the motive of the heart. That's actually why I stopped filming on the spot. Like if I feel it, like in the moment, they're totally okay with it. Like this is an awesome testimony. Somebody needs to hear this. Um, then I'll like, I'll mm -hmm. take out my phone. But it's rare nowadays when I started. I mean, that was before TikTok. Yeah. Now everybody's doing it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I started seeing people do the exact same thing. And then I was questioning my own motives. Now am I doing this for more content? Am I mm -hmm. doing this for... Because, I mean, every video I'm posting is getting millions of views. Yeah. Millions of views. Um, I remember those those videos. Um, every mm. status. I mean, 40K likes. Uh, mm. uh, one video, 110,000 comments. 26 wow. million views. I mean, it was every single... The momentum kept building for like seven months straight. Everything I was doing. 100,000 followers in one week. I mean, it was <laughs> wild. Uh, so I started checking my own motives. And then I felt like... Let me stop doing this, but I think it's needed to share like on a video or podcast like this, you know, get beyond the camera by yourself even and share this because we overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. It builds people's faith. I love being in, in your guys' meetings and uh, seeing people come up and testify. My faith gets stirred. In fact, I just got a, um, a memory on Snapchat. I only have Snapchat for my family. I was just looking at it at the hotel. And I went to my camera roll. It said stories. Um, I'm not too good at this, but uh, it basically just said, five years ago, I was with you all. It was actually my first meeting. Really? Wow. Here or was that in No, in that California. was in California. Um, I don't want to take too long to find it, but it was my first meeting. And you were singing mm -hmm. and you were telling people, lift up your hands. <laughs> worship the Lord. It was beautiful. Uh, you know, one of those meetings, I, I'm not going to, I'm going to be very transparent. I was actually skeptical when, um, like with certain things that people do and you had, it was something with like handkerchiefs, prayer cloths. Yes. Handkerchiefs. I'm thinking my pastor, he throws them at you if you're preaching good. Uh, you had prayer cloths and you called me up which I love, I love that the Lord placed it on your heart to bring me up because I was actually not with you, but, um, something, I don't know what, it was something in my head. And I, let me tell you, I was standing next to you and I felt electricity mm. go through my hand. Never felt that in my life, never felt that in my life. And I've experienced the power of God. It went through my hand. I was standing close to you. It's like, it came from, it was this shock, like, I can't even, it's more, I can just, uh, it's better experienced than explained, but it went through like, I guess standing next to you and it went through my whole thumb around my hand and it was this electricity shocking feeling. And I said, this is real. Wow. Yeah, we have a lot of people who, when they come up for prayer and I understand, and it, it, and even on this point, people being slain in the spirit. This is where there's a temporary physical reaction to the manifestation of the power of God. We want people to know that if you don't get slain, doesn't mean you're not saved. <laughs> yes, that's, that's a great point. Because, because that is my point, is that I don't make that a major emphasis in that 
I'm not always teaching on it and saying, you need to do this, or this is the sign of receiving the Holy Spirit. It's just something that happens, I've noticed, mm. when I pray for people. In fact, it began um, during what we call the fresh fire days. And by that, I mean the youth services I attended when I was 13, 14 years old. Wow. There was one service in particular where the youth pastor calls me up and says, help me lay hands on the kids. And so I'm like 13, 14 years old. I said, okay, I, I jump up and I start helping to pray for fellow youth. I, I reached out to pray for one, one guy and it was like somebody knocked the wind out of him and he just falls down. And I, I, I jolt back like this, or my, no, actually on that first one, my hands were like outstretched and he, he was gone and I was just stunned. Huh. I look over, my youth pastor's coming up to me. I thought, oh, I'm in trouble. Like I did something wrong. And he said something to the effect of, I have it written in a journal somewhere, but something to the effect of, Diggs, you got it. That's what he called me, Diggs. It's like a couple people call me Diggs. Uh, Steve calls me Diggs too. Diggs. It's like a nickname from, was, I was never in a gang or anything like that. No, it, was no. just, it was my youth group name. <laughs> Diggs. And so he goes, Diggs, you got it. Go lay hands on the others. And when he said that, my hands started trembling. I went to go lay hands on the next person. He starts sobbing, falls on the floor, and it was like he was sobbing so hard. It was like he, he was wow. trying to catch his breath. Yeah. And I moved to the net, and I was just feeling these jolts. And so this is what I tell people in the meetings when they go over, and then I, you know, I have them pick them up, and I'm talking, what are you feeling on you? They're like, what is this? And, and I have to tell them, this is the real deal. Yeah. And it's not coming from me. Yeah. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. It's right. his power. It's, I don't understand it. Uh -huh. I, I, I provide biblical argumentation for those who have an intellectual issue with it, but yeah. for the most part, I don't even need to explain it. It just is. It's something that happens. And you've sensed those in the meetings. Yeah. And I like to tell people, there's not something special about me. There's someone special about me. It's we the can. Holy Spirit. <laughs> and so whenever I go minister, I say, Holy Spirit, it has to be you. And I can't force that to happen. Uh -huh. It's not me controlling his power. It's just the way he does it in our meetings. It's, he's just like that. And I, don't, I can't fully explain it. I don't have even all the mechanics understood. I just know that sometimes in certain operations and certain flows of ministry, that power begins to flow like that. Yeah. And when it does, we get some incredible healing testimonies. Wow. We get um, incredible deliverance testimonies. You've seen it firsthand, some of yeah. the miracles that take place. And so to that point, yes, it's, it's, it's the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and I get that reaction a lot where people go, I thought this wasn't, I thought it was like pretend or they were just kind of doing it just yeah. to kind of yeah. Yeah. go along with the flow. And some people do that. And let's not, let's that. not, mis let's not make a mistake there. Uh -huh. Some people just kind of just fall over because they think that's what you're supposed to do. There's no denying that. But then there are genuine encounters. Yeah. And I have to just tell them, this is the real deal. That It's just his power. I told you it was the real deal. And, yeah. and that's all I can say. Uh, but on the point of the prayer cloths, I like the idea of praying for the power of the Holy Ghost to move tangibly. Think about how they were placed on the apostle and they were taken off and touched and uh, onto the sick and they yeah. were healed and delivered. As long as you don't sell them. That's yeah, the big yeah. thing. Then you end up like <laughs> Simon the sorcerer. Oh, Lord. As long as you're not selling <laughs> that. We'll that's sell that's where I have a major issue where they're like, you know, yours for $20, this special, it's like, how can you do that? It's such yeah. a, it's such an insult yeah. to the power of the Holy it Spirit. Is. Now, <clears throat> I see people that sell anointing oil, and they're not selling the anointing oil in the sense that they're selling the power. They're selling the ingredients, and, you know, yeah. it was made a certain way. Okay, yeah. that I understand. Yeah. You know, churches have to get their oil from somewhere. Yeah. But it's when, you, it's when you sell it, implying that when you buy this, you're buying the power. Mm. I cannot. Oh, that oh, angers no. me to no end. Yeah, imagine God. Yeah, I... um. I mean, you've come to our Rise Up Revival Conference and I still to this day, people come to me and they said, I love the way he flowed. I didn't even believe in falling out. I, I mean, that's a turnoff to me, but I fell out. You know, like the, <laughs> they just loved the way it was done with excellence and they felt God and it just gave them a fresh perspective and the power of God is so real. And I think our, our bodies respond differently to the power of God. That's right. why people... You know, they shake, they tremble, they, I mean, the priest in, in scripture couldn't even stand when the glory, when the cloud entered into the, 
uh, the the place. Yeah, pr- prior you said when you went to his service, uh-huh. you said you felt it like electricity. Yeah. But prior to that, what was your normal encounter with God experience like? Did it feel differently? Yeah, I never felt like electricity like that. I just would feel I would feel the power of God like it, rivers in my belly. Something's happening <laughs> on the inside of here, and um, and I would I would feel just different things, but never that. And every time I'm actually in your meetings, I would I feel that um, when we were at the American Bank Center, Corpus Christi for that one conference, and uh, I had to transition after you came off. <laughs> That's right. And I didn't know how to transition. I couldn't even speak properly. I'm stuttering. My knees are just shaking, and it was the power of God. Mm-hmm. I don't feel that everywhere. I mm-hmm. genuinely don't. Uh, but I didn't. It was never like the that feeling. It was always. I sense his power. I sense his presence very tangibly, but never to the point where like my body's reacting. Do you find that you're somewhat of a, and I want to word this carefully. When I say somewhat of a different person, Mm -hmm. I don't mean that you're putting on an act. It's kind of like if you're friends with someone who's in the NBA, if you're having lunch with them, they're one way. When they're on the court, they're another way. Yeah. When you know a coworker, you talk to them at work, they're one way. You talk to them at home, they're another way. Mm -hmm. Same person, they're not acting, but different forums require of us different types of focus and demeanors. Yeah. So when you're ministering, do you notice that demeanor shift? And what is that like for you? Oh, I noticed that yesterday, Saturday, I was preaching in Lansing, Illinois, and I felt it. Like we just had a rise up conference. I'm still recovering. You know, that took a lot out of us all. And I'm scheduled to preach at this event. And I'm like, I'm just going to flow. Lord, say what you want to say, because I don't have a fully prepared message here. And people loved it. But it was what I hit a vein in the message where I just felt the anointing come over me. And then people, you know, they're standing up like I'm preaching. I'm like, trying to sit down. And they're standing. Mm, wow. They don't want to sit down. And I just hit a vein. People are texting me after, telling me I hit a vein, like you were flowing. And I'm thinking, there's a shift. Mm-hmm. There's a change of the demeanor because it's the anointing of God. And maybe you could put more language to that of just the mantle, you know, that that you carry and the assignment that you that God has given you in the earth. I mean, when you tap in, that, for example, I think it, you can go and talk about how gifts and callings are without repentance. People could be living in sin, but still flow in power because God honors his word. So when people are preaching the word, even though they're living a jacked up life privately, God moves. And many people question that. Why is that? Why does God, why, if they're living that way, why is God using them so powerfully? And then we also know they come to him and say, did we not do these many mighty things in your name, miracles and signs and wonders? And then he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew. But I think it's because God honors his word. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. Well, my friend, thank you so much for joining me here on this yeah. podcast. And I have a question for you. Here's the question for conversation. Can you think of an instance where the Lord used you to impact someone's life during a moment of evangelism? Share it in the comment section. Don't forget to like and subscribe so you don't miss any of the content. And until next time, remember, nothing is impossible with God.